Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer as we begin our study of God's holy word. Heavenly Father, we pray for the holy unction today. We pray that the Holy Spirit will be poured out on each one of us as we examine very, very critical developments now at the end of time. And the solemnity rests upon us as we are aware that the very things that have been foretold by your prophet are now about to take place. And so we pray for the holy unction, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on every person watching and listening, and may the power of thy word vitalize our hearts and minds and souls is our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 16 and following. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And with those words we have a picture, a very brief picture of something that we hope to enlarge on today of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Satan knows that that is about to happen, and he has a seat of power on this earth called the Vatican and the papacy and Rome. And the Jesuit order now has had enormous changes taking place in it. In 2008, the black pope, the Jesuit superior general, resigned. First time it's ever happened in the history of the Jesuit order. Why? The full answer isn't in yet, but Eric Phelps believes it's because the Jesuits are positioning themselves for enormous developments, including two major wars. Kolvenbach was uh, replaced, but he went to the Middle East to oversee the war there, and the new pope from uh, Japan, new, new black pope, the new superior general, took over as head of the organization. But now something new has happened, new in the last 600 years, since the year 1514, and that is the Pope has resigned. Malachi Martin, in his book, The Windswept House, which is actually a novel, written in a novel format. Many authors will write in a novel format in order to cover themselves, to protect themselves when they're dealing with really tricky issues. But he said that 80% of it is actual fact in this book. And this book begins with an enthronement ceremony to enthrone Lucifer as head of the Vatican. This was held at St. Paul's Chapel in the Vatican at precisely the same time, by telephone, the same mass was con-celebrated in Charleston, South Carolina. A young girl who was used as the victim in that mass, who had blood, bled from her body as a sacrifice to Satan for the enthronement of Satan. Is that girl is still alive and she gave the details of that mass for enthroning Lucifer to Malachi Martin. And Malachi Martin himself, of course, as far as we can tell, was assassinated for what he revealed. But there is a chapter in this book, a very large chapter, entitled The Resignation Protocol. Because Malachi Martin, being a veteran insider in the Vatican order, believed that Pope John Paul II would be forced to resign. Now such a thing, when it finally did happen with Benedict XVI, it has been about 600 years since such a thing has happened. Almost 600 years since there was a resignation of the Pope. But who was he replaced by? A Jesuit for the first time in the history of, Rome, of, of the papacy, a Jesuit was head of the order. Now the Jesuit order was suppressed forever by Pope Clement 
in 1773, on the eve of the American Revolution. And then Adam Weishaupt, professor of canon law at the Jesuit Ingolstadt University, created an organization called the Illuminati. And in, 18, in 1776, May 1, we find that that date is on our dollar bill, the, Jesu the Illuminati order came into being. May 1, 1776, and that date is celebrated around the world in communist countries as May Day to this very day. Now, what did he find was taking place? He believed that being a Vatican insider, that there were various Masonic cardinals, cardinals that were involved with masonry, who would call the Pope in, or the Pope would have a meeting with them, and they would lay before the Pope a resignation protocol in which the Pope would resign and he would hand over his authority to these cardinals. Now, it didn't happen with John Paul II, but it may well have happened with Benedict XVI. We do not know. There are mu there's much speculation uh, on the Internet about whether he was uh, resigning because of the threat of a, of a lawsuit to be brought against him. But what is interesting is where this now Pope Emeritus, Benedict XVI, retired to. He retired to Castle Gandolfo, which is the headquarters of the Jesuit astronomy project, astrobiology. Now, there is a sister observatory to Castle Gandolfo in Arizona. It's on top of a holy mountain, a mountain called by the uh, Western Apaches Zil Cha Sian. It's Mount Graham. And up there, behind a secured area, you cross the security lines, you go to jail. Above 10,000 feet is the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope. And in this secured area, they're using a telescope with an acronym LUCIFER, Large Binocular Telescope Near-Infrared Utility with Camera and Integral Field Unit for Extragalactic Research, using multi-object and long-slit infrared spectrograph imagers. And what are they doing? What are the Jesuits doing? They are eagerly watching outer space, intergalactic space, in the infrared domain to see approaching alien extraterrestrial life in preparation for their plan to announce to the world the presence of an alien savior, a savior who is extra terrestrial. Now, that brings us to what we know from inspiration. First of all, before we go to inspiration, I want to give you a little more information about this telescope. Lucifer, Rebecca Boyle, Popular Science Magazine, writes, Lucifer, which stands for Large Binocular Telescope Near-Infrared Utility with Camera and Integral Field Unit for Extragalactic Research, is a chilled instrument attached to a telescope in Arizona. And yes, it's named for the devil, whose name itself means Morning Star, and which happens to be right next to the Vatican Observatory on Mount Graham in Tucson. Then the researcher Thomas Horn, who is, has a burden to expose this to the world because he believes that the Jesuits are attempting to make contact with demonic spirits in the form of extraterrestrial beings, one of whom will be the alien savior who will save humanity from the abyss that humanity is about to go into. And that brings you up another subject which we hope to have time for today, and that is 
the planned global collapse of the world economy, and the chaos to be created by the super soldiers, the satanic super soldiers, which are even now being created through the Illuminati music by such individuals as Beyonce and Jay-Z, who regularly go to the White House and are best friends with Obama. We were told later by the LBT systems engineer, Thomas Horn says, who spent significant time with us that day, the day he went up, and was allowed actually by the Jesuits who didn't understand fully what he was up to, they allowed him in to look at their operation at VAT, the Vatican Advanced uh, Telescope, Technological Telescope Operation and the Lucifer Project. We were later told by the LPT, that's the uh, Large Binocular Telescope Systems Engineer who spent significant time with us that day, that another instrument, Lucifer II, is scheduled to arrive at the observatory any time now and will complete the two multi-object and long-slit infrared spectrograph imagers they need for studying the heavens in search of, among other things, exoplanets that may host intelligent life. You see, they believe that they can see alien extraterrestrials in the infrared zone, which the human eye can't see as they're approaching from intergalactic outer space. We would also visit the Heinrich Hertz submillimeter telescope that day, which sets between the LBT, the Large Binocular Telescope, and the real target of our quest, the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope and the Jesuits who work there. Now, this telescopic array is the most sophisticated optical telescopic array in the world. And the Jesuits are there. They had a special dispensation from Congress. Congress had to pass a special act so they could have this observatory on the top of this Apache Holy Mountain, Mount Graham, because the area was banned because of Red Squirrel um, fears that the Red Squirrel would become exterminated, etc. So Congress made a special dispensation for the Jesuits to do this and for the University of Arizona to do this. Now, the Vatican astronomer, the eminent theologian and full professor of fundamental theology at the Pontificia Universita della Santa Croce in Rome, connected with Opus Dei, Father Giuseppe Tanzella Nitti, said this, Christians will not immediately need to renounce their faith in God, quote, simply on the basis of the reception of this new unexpected information of a religious character from extraterrestrial civilizations, end quote. However, once the religious content, quote, unquote, originating from outside the earth, quote, has been verified, end quote, they will have to conduct, quote, a rereading of the gospel inclusive of the new data, end quote. So what is he saying? Christians are not going to have to immediately renounce their faith in God simply because of the new unexpected information the Jesuits are going to get, information of a religious character from extraterrestrial civilizations. See, the Jesuits believe that there are extraterrestrial civilizations out there that are trying to make contact with us. They are going to send representatives here, and there is going to appear a, an extraterrestrial alien savior who will save the human race in an hour of terrible distress. However, once the religious content originating from outside the earth, that is from these extraterrestrial civilizations, has been verified, they will have to conduct a rereading of the gospel inclusive of the new data. So they're going to add on to the gospel. They're going to reread the gospel and see it in a new light. They're going to see God in a different light. He's no longer going to be anthropomorphic. In other words, as the Bible represents him having features similar to man, but he'll probably have features similar to the extraterrestrial uh, beings that will manifest themselves on the earth. The Vatican Observatory Director there on Mount Graham, who is a Jesuit, an Argentinian Jesuit, the same as the new Pope, Jose Funes, says extraterrestrials are going to, quote, confirm the true faith of Christianity and the dominion of Rome. So the Jesuits are preparing to introduce the alien savior. They're preparing, basically, in other words, to introduce Lucifer, Satan, to the world 
as the Savior of the world. It's a full court press by the Vatican involving one of the most teles most uh, sophisticated telescopes in the world, the most sophisticated optical telescope in the world. Now, we're going to be looking at a lot of material today, some of which is rank heresy by the Jesuits, but it's combined with elements of truth, as you'll see. And so as we're about to look at what is about to take place with Rome, we are going on a journey into the mind of the papacy, the Jesuit order, and Opus Dei. <clears throat> so, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. First of all, we must know our own orientation. And so I invite you to take your Bible with me and let us turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3. According as his divine power, well, let's pick up with verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. So we become partakers of the divine nature when we are born again. We partake of Christ's nature, righteousness by faith. Paul upheld two ways the man was trying to be saved in his day. There was the law method. And he said, if you get involved in that, in Galatians, he said, if you allow yourself to be circumcised in an effort to keep the law, you are bound to observe the entire law perfectly from beginning to end, which is, it's not going to happen because you've already sinned. It's impossible to keep the law. So there remains the other way, the true way of salvation. The law is there to show us our sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. But salvation comes through the Savior, Jesus Christ. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So Jesus has given us all things. He is an all-sufficient Savior. He's given us everything that we need. The bread of life, the water of life, the light of life, everything, the road map, the word, everything has been given to us by Jesus. Now let's turn to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And let's pick up with verse 25. Well, let's pick up, uh, let's actually pick up a little earlier in verse 17. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is a different kind of a priest than any priest that the Hebrew people had known except for the order of Melchizedek. And what was Melchizedek? No one knew who his father was. No one knew who his mother was. No one knew his genealogy. He came out of just out of the city that he was living in when he blessed Abraham. But the Bible has nothing further to say about his genealogy. And so, Jesus was not born to the line of Levitical priests. He has a different kind of a priesthood, and it's very important to understand that for this purpose today. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear <clears throat> and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is a priest forever. We are not to be looking for another Savior. We are not to be looking for an extraterrestrial alien Savior who's going to be coming that the Jesuits are looking for. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. So Jesus continues forever. His life goes back 
into eternity past. The Word was with God and into eternity future. He continues ever and he has an unchangeable priesthood. Keep your finger here, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God, and the, Hebrew, the Greek construction means the Word was God in very essence. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Our Savior, we can trace back through the dim mists of eternity past, He was always there. And He will always be there in the future because He is fully God. He is the I Am who claimed to be the I am over and over again when he was here on this earth. Let's look at verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This was an unheard of thing that God would take upon himself material human flesh. Never happened before in the history of the universe. It was a unique event in the history of the universe when God became flesh. And because Jesus claimed to be fully God and claimed to be the I Am, the great I Am, the eternally self-existent one, the people tried to stone him again and again for blasphemy. And that's why he was crucified, because he claimed to be God, which he was. And so our Savior has an unchangeable priesthood, and he continues forever, and he was always there as far back. And these texts lighten up the distant past of eternity, and they lighten up the distant future eternity. Our Savior, it was a once-in-a-universe event when He came and was, became incarnate. He never did this for any other race of being. And mind you, Ellen White says, God has worlds upon worlds that are His that have never sinned, and Ellen White saw that they had the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in these other worlds. But the people there told them, the orders of creation, whatever they were, told her they had never partaken. They had never disobeyed like we did here on this earth. And therefore, she saw that they were beautiful, much lovelier than we are. They're not strange creatures, but very lovely, very beautiful creatures. Now let's go back here to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Wherefore he is also able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. When you go to God for intercession because of your sins, you go directly to Christ, and he's able to save to the uttermost. That means no matter how bad you've been, how terrible you've been, the greatest sinner in the world, he can save you to the uttermost. And he ever liveth to make intercession. We do not have other intercessors. Now, Rome does not have an all-sufficient Savior. Their Savior is weak, ineffective, and relatively helpless. That's why Rome does not view Christ's sacrifice on the cross of Calvary as sufficient and they must repeatedly offer the sacrifice of the Mass instead. Hundreds of times, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of times. They repeat the sacrifice of Christ, they claim. And they hold up the Eucharist. And they have many, many sacrifices. But the Bible says, and let's look at it here. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. What a great high priest we have, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. One time incarnation, one time sacrifice on the cross. He did it once. It is blasphemy to do it millions of more times like Rome has done. He did it once when he offered up himself, for the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son who is consecrated 
forevermore. Now, back to Rome and their conception of Christ. They have to have many sacrifices because they do not have the exalted understanding of the cross of Calvary that we have in the desire of ages and that we have in the Gospels. And this is why Rome has to have saints to intercede where the Bible says that he maketh, he ever liveth, he, Christ, ever liveth to make intercession for us. They have to have the saints to intercede for them because Christ is not adequate. They have to have Mary, who they call a co-redemptrix or a co-savior, equal with Christ. They've elevated her to be equal with Christ as a redeemer. And that is why they also must have an earthly priesthood to forgive sins. And so their people are trained to go to the priest for forgiveness instead of going to Christ for, to, for forgiveness. And they have a pope to stand as the vicar of Christ on earth with every priest as an altar Christos, another Christ. Yes, Rome does not have an all-sufficient Savior. And that laid the groundwork for the Jesuits now looking for another alien Savior. But we have a Savior who is omnipotent, who is powerful, who said to his disciples, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Because they have an inadequate understanding of Jesus, they picture him always as helpless, either as a baby or on the cross. But our Savior is mighty. He has all power and it is clothed in the garment of Christ's righteousness that his people are to go forth to the battle of Armageddon at the end of time, which is soon to break upon us. And Jesus is soon to come in great power and majesty and glory to take us home to be with him forever. Now Satan is preparing to come to impersonate Christ, to usurp Christ's place, and to gather the people of the world into his camp. That is why the Jesuits are looking for the coming of an alien savior to save the world. And when Rome looks hard enough for an apparition of Mary to appear, Satan supplies them with what they're looking for, and he gives them an evil spirit, like at Fatima and other places, an evil spirit to have the appearance of Mary. And there can be little doubt that Satan will cooperate with those who are cooperating with him in the Jesuit order in providing for them an alien savior, which they are now scanning the heavens for in the infrared domain. Now, I want to just say a word about the resignation of Pope Benedict XVI. He has resigned and retired to Castle Gandolfo, which is the Jesuit the headquarters of the Jesuit astronomical, astronomical effort, which is in tandem with Mount Graham over here in America on top of that holy mountain, that Apache holy mountain in, in uh, Arizona. And who was it that took his place? A man who the media presented as uh, a lover of the poor, a man who lived in his own apartment, he took public transportation, took the bus, took the subway, made his own meals, and they just about worshipped the ground that he stood on when he was inaugurated as Pope. But those who have searched into his background know another story. Because this new Pope, who took the name Francis, Francis I, a name never taken by a Pope before, he is the first Jesuit ever to be a pope. And we started talking about this. 1773, the Jesuit order was suppressed. 1776, the Illuminati came into being, May 1. Then 1814, the Jesuit order was restored. And now a Jesuit is head of the papacy. And he himself has taken vows of submission to the black pope. So now, more than ever before, the black pope is ruling over the entire apparatus of the papacy and all of its orders and the entire global field of the papal establishment. 
an Argentinian Jesuit who has worked with the CIA and with the dictators in South America in what was called Argentine's Dirty War. Argentina's Dirty War. It was called Operation Condor. And in it, tens of thousands of people disappeared and were killed. Many of them were thrown out of air, aircraft into the ocean. So he has long experience of doing rendition. Here's an unclassified Department of State document on the Third World War in South America. And uh, Operation Condor is referenced here. Unclassified Department of State, U.S. Department of State document. In fact, Michael Chusadovsky says that this is Washington's pope. This is the pope that Washington wanted to have. This is the pope who will work with Washington. New pope tied to Argentina's dirty war. So the Jesuits are positioning themselves for enormous, enormous developments. Now, I want to take you to the great controversy where Ellen White is describing the very thing that the Jesuits are trying to create right now. And this is from Great Controversy 623 and following. Fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens. This is what the Jesuits are looking for. According to Thomas Horn, this veteran researcher who has a burden to expose what the Jesuits are up to with their Lucifer telescope and their preparations to announce an alien savior to the world, he says they are trying to establish contact, in his opinion, with demons. And Ellen White says, fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens. This is going to happen. And I believe these are, she's talking about things that we're going to be able to see with our own eyes. You know, when I was a very, very little boy, and I haven't told this to too many people, I had a powerful dream one night. I dreamed it was the end of time. And we were in a time of great danger. And I dreamed that these supernatural, and I don't know if I ever heard this from the great controversy. I was so little, I doubt that anyone ever even read this to me. But there were fearful signs of a supernatural character that were being manifested in the heavens. And my mother said to me, don't look at it. It was a very powerful dream I've never forgotten when I was a very little boy. Fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens in token of the power of miracle-working demons. Now, this brings up a whole other picture about the Nephilim we're going to look at in just a few minutes. But first, we must continue with what Ellen White is saying. The spirits of devils will go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to fasten them in deception, and the Jesuits are working in collaboration in tandem with this effort by Satan and his evil spirits to fasten them in deception and urge them on to unite with Satan in his last struggle against the government of heaven. So the Jesuits are looking for information of a religious character and content from extragalactic, from extraterrestrial civilizations, which will then be incorporated into the, the, the rereading of the gospel and our re-understanding of the of God, and it will create the dominion of Rome, confirm the dominion of Rome. So you can begin to see the picture of what the Jesuits are wanting to, to create. They have now a Jesuit pope. They have Jesuit astronomers. They have everything put in position for announcing this extraterrestrial information from extraterrestrial civilizations and ultimately the introduction of an extraterrestrial alien savior to save the human race. By these agencies, rulers and subjects will be alike deceived. Persons will arise pretending to be Christ himself and claiming the title and worship which belongs to the world's redeemer. 
They will perform wonderful miracles of healing and will profess to have revelations from heaven contradicting the testimony of the scriptures. So notice what's happening. The whole human race is getting prepared for accepting revelations that are contrary to scripture, all on a supernatural plane. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. And that's what the Jesuits are preparing to announce to the world. An alien, extra, extraterrestrial, supernatural being that will save humanity. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation, in Revelation 1, 13 to 15. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld, greater than the glory of the angel who came to the shepherds, greater than the heavenly host singing. Glory to God in the highest. This will be spectacular. And God will allow Satan to have all this supernatural manifestation. The full force of satanic power will be thrust upon the human family. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. And God allows this to happen. For you remember that he's even going to allow fire to come down from heaven in the sight of men. The shout of triumph rings out on the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people, and then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. And you can see how the Jesuits are just eager to work in a whole body of new religious content for a rereading of the Gospels. There is also a cultural dimension to this because back in the 1770s, there was a movie that came out that was very powerful throughout America called E.T. I never saw it, and I thank God I never did, but I sure heard a lot about it. In fact, I even heard a preacher on Sabbath preaching to a, a structure academy and the church congregation telling them that they should go and see E.T. Apparently, this extraterrestrial being was very sweet and loving and kind, from what I understand. But notice how Satan, when he appears as Christ, will command all to hallow the day which he has blessed in changing the Sabbath to Sunday. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. So if you hold on to the Sabbath in that setting, the seventh day Sabbath, you will be accused of blasphemy. And the whole world population will be bowing and worshiping and obeying and, and adoring this being. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. Like the Samaritans who were deceived by Simon Magus, the multitudes from the least to the greatest give heed to these sorceries saying, this is the great power of God, Acts 8.10. But the people of God will not be misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. So here's the test. Here's the test. And for all the people today who have laid this aside for fire 40, 25, 20, or for the Vern Bates tampering charge, or for one heresy after another, they're setting themselves up for a fall, a terrible, terrible fall. You go by the word of God. This is where we stand. 
This is the truth we stand on. This is the omnipotent power that shapes and transforms our lives. This is a reality greater to us than our eyes and our ears and the material world around us. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast. Watch who you bless and who others are blessing. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast and his image, the very class of with whom, upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled wrath shall be poured out. When God says he's going to pour out his wrath on those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, you don't go blessing that group. So that is a clear identifier. Two things so far now. First of all, he contradicts the Bible testimony about the Sabbath and says that it's been changed. And remember, if the Jesuits have their way, the whole world will be conditioned to accepting revelations from heaven contradicting the testimony of scriptures. So even if an angel of God, as Paul says, comes to you with a different gospel than what's in here, you reject it even though he looks like an angel. Remember what happened when Jesus was in the wilderness, in the desert. After 40 days of fasting, his visage was marred more than that of any man. He was in anguish. And the power of hunger gripped him, finally. He had been sustained as if in the presence of God as he contemplated his mission for 40 days and 40 nights. Fasting. And now he was a hungered. And Satan appeared to him as if he, Satan, were from heaven. And he said, there's been an angel cast out from heaven. And I think it must be you. You see how Satan works? So now, two ways already the faithful will know. He says that there's been a change regarding the Sabbath. And number two, his blessing is on the worshipers of the beast in his image, the very class that the Bible declares God's unmingled wrath should be poured out. Remember, this is the word of God. This is God speaking to you directly. And furthermore, Satan is not permitted to counterfeit the manner of Christ's advent. The Savior has warned his people against deception upon this point and has clearly foretold the manner of his second coming. There shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Notice it's going to be primarily aimed at the very elect. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This coming, there is no possibility of counterfeiting. It will be universally known and witnessed by the whole world. And that's why God's people will say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. They have to wait for him through the time when Satan appears as if he's Christ. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures, diligent, study hard, and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the scribes were diligent students of the word, but they did not receive the love of the truth. And they did err, not knowing the power of God nor the scriptures. By the Bible testimony, these faithful ones will detect the deceiver in his disguise. To all the testing time will come. By the sifting of temptation, the genuine Christian will be revealed. So notice as wave after wave of temptation comes over you and you stand fast, it reveals more and more clearly that you are a genuine Christian. Are the people of God so firmly established upon his word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses, to what they see, to what they hear, to what they can even touch? Is this stronger Is it in your heart? Does it have a stronger grip, a more powerful grip? Does it mold you more than the things you see now day by day? How many there are who television molds, or Hollywood molds, or the culture around them molds, and the music, the ears here. No, we must be molded by this. 
to prepare ourselves for this great test. Are the people of God so firmly established upon his word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses? Would they in such a crisis cling to the Bible and the Bible only? Already they've been mocked by our president who calls them clingers. The people way out in the woods who cling to their religion and they cling to their guns. The clingers. Satan will, if possible, prevent them from obtaining a preparation to stand in that day. He will arrange affairs so as to help hedge up their way, entangle them with earthly treasures, cause them to carry a heavy, worrisome burden, that their hearts may be overcharged with the cares of this life, and the day of trial may come upon them as a thief. And what is she saying? This is the most important thing, more important than your work, more important than your money, more important than anything else, in your life to be established upon this. Now, Francis I is an Argentinian Jesuit, a new pope. The head of the VAT, V-A-T-T, and the uh, Jesuit astronomers on Mount Graham is an Argentinian Jesuit priest. They are both Jesuits capable of working together in collaboration to announce the coming of Satan as Christ, as an extraterrestrial savior, to confirm the dominion of Rome and the true faith of Christianity, as Vatican Observatory Director Jesuit Father Jose Funes has asserted. <clears throat> now, I want to look at a foundation the foundation of the thinking of the Jesuits about extraterrestrial life. So turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 6. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply upon the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants. In the Hebrew, it's Nephilim. There were Nephilim, giants, in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Now, Thomas Horn, who is exposing this Jesuit effort with their Lucifer telescope, Steve Quayle, and according to Thomas Horn, the papacy, all believe the same way about these verses. And here's what they believe. In verse 2, when it says, The sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose, they believe that the sons of God is speaking about angels, fallen angels in this case, who liked the looks of the human women, and they cohabited with them. And the result was verse 4. There were Nephilim. They, women bore Nephilim. They were not pure humans. They were half human, half angels. They were extraterrestrials. They were hybrid humans, they call them. They were giants in the earth in those days, Nephilim in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now, is it possible for angels to bear children with human women? So let us turn to the Bible for our answer, Matthew 22, what Jesus said about this subject. Matthew 22, verses 29 and 30. And in this case, we have the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. And they decided to propose a hypothetical to Jesus, which they believed Jesus would be unable to answer, and therefore they could disprove the resurrection. And the hypothetical rested upon an institution that God gave in the Old Testament, 
That institution was called Leverite Marriage. And the way it worked was this. If a man married a woman and died before he had any offspring, the closest of kin, which would be that man's brother if he had one, was under obligation, under the laws of Leverite marriage, to marry the woman of the deceased husband, to marry his brother's wife. Then the child that would be born, the firstborn, would inherit everything that he would have inherited from the original brother. In that way, every family retained their parcel of ground in the Holy Land, in the, in the land of Canaan. And they didn't ever have the family name die out. In the case of Boaz and Ruth, Boaz wanted to marry Ruth, but there was a nearer kinsman who had the responsibility to marry marry a Ruth because of her husband who had died and there had not been any offspring. And so he called in the nearest of kin. They went through the ceremony where the shoe is taken off and various rituals to show that the nearest of kin did not want to marry Ruth. And so then Boaz was free to marry her. So here is what the Sadducees proposed. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh, and last of all the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. And what did Jesus say? Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. And what area had they erred in? The very area that the papacy, Thomas Horne, and Steve Quayle all have erred in. Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. The angels do not marry. They're incapable of marrying. They are flaming spirits. Hold your finger here and turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall, be, who shall be heirs of salvation. And let's look at Psalms 103, 20 and 21. Psalms 103. 20 and 21. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word, Bless ye the Lord, all his hosts, ye ministers of him. They are ministers. They are angels of God. But in Psalms 104, verse 4, we read, Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. So, the angels are like a flaming fire. They are spirits. They don't have material bodies, although they can assume a material body when they appear to men. But by nature... They do not have material bodies, and they are incapable of procreation. As far as we know, there is no other race in all of the universe of created, intelligent, worshiping beings that has the, that dimension of the image of God of procreation, except for humanity. And turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Let's pick up with verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. So man was expected to multiply, to have children. This the angels cannot do. And this is an area that Satan has been very jealous of mankind about that mankind can reproduce and he cannot. 
nor can any of the other angels, nor, as far as we know, can any of the other intelligent beings on the other worlds. But in this area, he has deceived the papacy. He has deceived Thomas Horne and Steve Quayle, even though Thomas Horne and Steve Quayle are warning with all their might about how the papacy is making contact with demonic spirits and is preparing to introduce demonic extraterrestrial beings as the savior of the world, yet they are deceived on this point, and error is never harmless. So angels do not have the power of procreation. It is impossible for them to cohabitate with women and spawn a race of giants. But now back to uh, Genesis chapter 6. There's something else we need to look at here. So you get a picture of what's going on in the thinking and theology. Verse 5, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Now notice, what did he see? The wickedness. It was the behavior of man that brought on the flood. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord, or he felt grieved at his heart that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Now, and then verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let me tell you what Thomas Horne believes about those verses. <clears throat> He believes that angels cohabited, cohabited with human women, creating and spawning a race of giants that were hybrid angels and man. And that by the time of the flood, every person on earth was a hybrid human and was part extraterrestrial, except for Noah and his family, who were the only true human beings left on the earth. And that's why God saved them. So they see the reason for the flood as a genetic thing. It was a genetic problem with hybridization, with extraterrestrials. And they believe that it's happening again on the earth. And they also believe that these hybrids do not have redeemable souls. Now, it's not just them, because Thomas Horn tells of meeting with one of the top men in the Assemblies of God Church and at a, at a meal. They had a special meal together and, and that man said that was one of the most troubling things that he could think of, that there were human beings on earth today that did not have redeemable souls. But you see where error leads to. Whenever you find something that is not sound, not based on the Bible, don't touch it because it leads to un believable conclusions. These people also, such as Steve Quayle and Thomas Horn, believe that there were pre-Adamic races of men, such as reptilian races of men. It's simply not true. Why? Because what does the Bible say in Genesis 1 verse 2? In Genesis 1 verse 2, it says, the earth was without form. Well, let's start with verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. In the Hebrew, that's tohu avohu. It means, tohu means nothingness, emptiness, void, nothing there. So there was no pre-Adamic race of man. Now let me tell you something that is disturbing, and that is the teachings of evolution now that are coming into the structure universities. I mean, it's, it's really getting bad in some areas. And this is where all of this corruption leads to. And it is all funneling down to this final issue at the end of time. What will we, who will we be worshiping? Will it be the true Savior with his unchangeable priestly, high priestly ministry? Or will it be an alien an alien savior. Now, we've completely run out of time, but I want to conclude with a few verses from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And verse 16. 
with a description of the true second coming. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So when Jesus truly comes, his feet are not going to touch this earth at the second coming, but will at the third when he touches at the end of the millennium when he touches the Mount of Olives. But it will be a very noisy event. It will be something the whole human race witnesses. And it will be accompanied by the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And I want to just conclude here with a few words from the Spirit of Prophecy. Soon there appears in the east a small black cloud about half the size of a man's hand. It is a cloud which surrounds the Savior and which seems in the distance to be shrouded in darkness. The people of God know this to be the sign of the Son of Man. Notice they don't have to use infrared telescopes. They can see it. In solemn silence, they gaze upon it as it draws nearer the earth, becoming brighter and more glorious, till it is a great white cloud, its base a glory like consuming fire, and above it the rainbow of the covenant. Jesus rides forth as a mighty conqueror. 